welcome to this year's Asia Investment Conference hosted by Credit Suisse. I'm Li Pingzhang, Chief Executive Officer of Greater China. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Margaret Chen, Director General of the World Health Organization, who will speak to us on all the vital topics of the ongoing fight against the spread of fatal infectious diseases. Dr. Chen, a native of Hong Kong, is currently in her second term as Director General of the WHO and has been in this role since 2006. Since the beginning of her career at the WHO, Dr. Chen has been committed to improving the health of the most vulnerable and has identified improvements in the health of people living in Africa and in the health of women in general as key performance indicators for the WHO. As such, she's constantly fighting to turn the focus of the organization's attention to those in greatest need. In today's keynote address, Dr. Chen will share with us her valuable insights on the spread of infectious or communicable diseases. The key question we have addressed today will be, is the world winning the fight against the outbreak and the spread of infectious or communicable diseases. Diseases such as SARS, H5N1, and malaria, which are transmitted from one person to another or to from an animal to a person, can be life-threatening. Dr. Chen is well-placed to update on the best response should such an outbreak occur. We have, seen, we have seen how government can panic and sometimes turn to costly measures to calm public fears and raise confidence during an outbreak. But are these measures effective? And what must Asian countries to do ensure that viruses, viruses can be controlled? And finally, what does all this mean for the Asian investment community? I personally look forward to hearing the answers to these questions and much more. Welcome Dr. Margaret Chen to the AIC. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you, distinguished participants, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me thank Credit Suisse for this invitation to address the 2014 Asian Investment Conference. Investment Conference, ladies and gentlemen, is not the usual forum to discuss uh, health issues. But I congratulate Credit Suisse for making this move. Clearly, the relationship between health and wealth, which is your main business, is extremely strong. Let me also thank Credit Suisse for last year's report on sugar consumption at a crossroad. Sugar consumption is an issue of interest for economic markets and, of course, for world trade, but also for public health. Given its contribution to the obesity epidemic and the associated risks of diabetes, heart disease, and several diet-related cancers, we need to pay attention to these. And these are diseases, gentlemen and friends, ladies. These are diseases that will break the bank because they are extremely expensive. I personally fully agree with the report's overarching promise, premise. The global obesity epidemic and related nutrition issues are arguably the century's primary social health concerns. As I have said before, chronic diseases are a slow 
motion disaster for economies as well as for, for health. But today, my topic is on a more abrupt and acute shock to economies. And these are outbreaks of epidemics of infectious diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout much of human history, plagues, pests, smallpox, and the great pots, that is, civilists, ravaged populations, decimated armies, quarantine cities, and ships, kill a third of Europe's population, alter power structures, and kept life short and generally miserable. All that deadly and disruptive power began to diminish with the development of the first vaccine in the 18th century, Pasteur's germ theory in the 19th century, and the discovery of penicillin in the early 20th century as the first of many miracle drugs. Humanity was gaining the upper hand. Smallpox could be prevented, tuberculosis and syphilis could be cured. Death was no longer inevitable from an infected scratch or a soldier's battle wounds. Epidemic-prone diseases like yellow fever and malaria, famous for stopping construction of the Panama Canal, were brought under control in many areas through the elimination of mosquito breeding sites. As hygiene and living conditions improve, cholera continued to sail along international trading routes, but no longer left millions of dead in its wake. Again, infectious diseases lost much of their sting. Today, it is hard to imagine the dread, death, and sorrow, the towns full of funerals with small coffins caused by scarlet fever, a disease that could rob a family of all its children in a matter of days. So we are winning, are we? Are we winning the fight against infectious diseases? Let me reassure you, we are certainly better armed and defended on multiple fronts than at any time in history. And since the start of this century, we have certainly made great progress against the three killer diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. More money and powerful new tools produced in partnership with industry supported this progress. The epidemic of HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, which had been raging out of control, peaked and began a slow but steady decline. The malaria situation was turned around, with some African countries reporting 50% drops in, case, in cases and deaths. The number of childhood diseases caused many deaths stuck above 10 million for at least 30 years, was cut by nearly half. This is a stunning progress, but these are not clear-cut wins. The only decisive victory over an infectious disease is its eradication. In the centuries-long fight against infectious diseases, this has happened only once, with the eradication of smallpox in 1979. Only two other diseases have been targeted for eradication, polio and guinea worm disease. For multiple reasons, infectious diseases are extremely resilient. Abundant evidence tells us that if control measures lapse, the disease will come roaring back. This happened most dramatically with yellow fever and with dengue. Both diseases were brought under control in the mid 20th century. As the number of cases and deaths fell, so did the level of concern. Today, Ladies and gentlemen, both diseases are again causing explosive and disruptive outbreaks, also in new areas. Compared with the situation 50 years ago, the worldwide incidence of dengue has risen 30-fold, and many countries in this region are affected. The need to maintain control efforts is very clear. 
but so is one of the lessons that emerged during the past decade. International commitment and cooperation, including with the pharmaceutical industry, can bring well-known infectious diseases to their knees. Today, the biggest threat, the biggest threat from communicable diseases or infectious diseases comes from the unknown. The next new virus lurking in the jungles of sub-Saharan Africa or in the wet markets and teeming cities of Asia. These two geographical areas have traditionally been regarded as the breeding ground for new diseases. About 75% of new diseases emerge following close contact between humans and domestic or wild animals. Africa and Asia offer multiple opportunities for these contacts to occur. As the SARS outbreak of 20, 2003 make abundantly clear, new diseases have become a much larger menace in a world of radically interconnected and interdependence with this phenomenal volume of international travel and trade. SARS put every city with an international airport at risk of imported cases and caused the Asian economy at least 30, 30 billion. I was going to say $30, $30 billion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the world of viruses, bacteria, and parasites is volatile and highly unpredictable. But one thing is certain, new diseases will continue to emerge, most likely at an accelerated pace. Constant mutation and adaptation are the survival mechanisms of the microbial world. Any organism, like the influenza virus, which many of us are familiar with, the influenza virus, can copy itself more than a billion times a day in a single person. Any organism that can do that has a distinct evolutionary advantage. Some of these mutations will ensure survival when pressures arise, allowing the virus to adapt to new environments, adopt a new way of spreading, jump from an animal host to humans, evade the defenses of immune system, or escape the killing effect of drugs. Microorganisms are well equipped to take advantage of every opportunity to invade or evade. Changes, changes in the way humanity inhabits the planet have given the microbial world multiple new opportunities to exploit. These changes are driven by powerful global trends that are difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. Examples include, first, overpopulation and the resulting pressure on finite land and resources have encouraged humans to enter previously uninhabited areas. These incursions, whether for logging, plantation development, or in search of food or adventure, can disrupt finely tuned, delicately balanced ecological niches that have been undisturbed for centuries. Many new diseases, including Ebola and Marburg hemorrhagic fevers, as we are talking, I got an alert from my office. The country called Guinea is reporting Ebola. So these are real risks that we need to manage. As I said, Ebola and Marburg hemorrhagic fevers emerge following human incursions into jungles and rainforests. Environmental mismanagement, including deforestation, is another global trend that opens opportunity for new disease to emerge. Nipah virus, especially for those of you who are coming from Malaysia, you know very well this disease. It emerged in Malaysia following the slashing and burning of millions of acres of forests, which were the natural habitat of an animal called fruit bats. And these bats resettled in fruit orchards near pig farms. The virus spread from the, pig, from the bats to the pigs and then to humans. 
eventually causing 265 cases and killing 115 of them. Climate change. Climate change is likely the most global of all recent trends. Diseases that involve an insect, rodent, or other vector in their transmission cycle are extremely sensitive to changes in climate variables. Hantaviruses, for those of you who come from the US, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, a severe respiratory disease, were first detected in the US after unusual patterns of rainfall, which forced deer mice to leave their wild habitat and search for food near human settlements. Evidence is mounting that the geographical distribution of infectious diseases will be altered as the climate continues to change. A study published earlier this month provided evidence that climate change will increase the malaria burden in the densely populated highlands of Africa and South America. Our world is further characterized, ladies and gentlemen, by a food supply that is globalized, highly industrialized, and driven by competitive pressure to produce more and more food at ever lower prices. This is especially true for meat, and this is especially relevant to Asia, where the growth of increasingly affluent consumers, the big middle class, has increased the demand for meat and dairy products. The industrialization of food production is an especially worrisome trend. Why? In agribusiness, also you know, quite important in Asia here, they are increasingly adopting the model of confined animal feeding operations. These operations can produce large quantity of cheap meat, but these are not farms anymore. They are what we call protein factories with multiple hazards for health and for the environment. These hazards come from the crowding of large number of animals in very small spaces, the stressful conditions that promote disease. Animals are like human. If you put them in a very crowded space, they can be quite stressful. Mm -hmm. The huge quantities of dangerous animal waste, the need for frequent human contact with the animals, and the use of large volumes of antibiotics at sub-therapeutic levels to prevent disease and promote growth. The low dose are a recipe, the low doses are a recipe for the development of drug resistance, as they kill the weakest bacteria, but let the strongest one survive. The pressure to cut costs can lead to additional risk. The emergence of mad cow disease in Europe with associated human cases is thought to have followed the practice of feeding cattle bone meal produced from the carcasses of other cattle. In other words, cattle eating cattle. Fortunately, this practice has been abandoned. A strong preference for freshly slaughtered poultry keeps the wet markets open in several parts of Asia, including Hong Kong, the city I know best. Most scientists view the wet markets as hot spots, hot spots for the emergence of new viruses that could spark the next influenza pandemic. The practice or race of raising uh, chickens near homes has been the source of numerous human cases of H5N1, as in the case of Indonesia, as in the case of Vietnam, Cambodia. Also, among very young children who play or crawl near birds or their droppings. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these trends, like unprecedented population density, incursions into previously uninhabited areas, people crowded together with domestic animals, a changing climate, and the industrialization of food production put our world on a dangerous trajectory with new diseases, just one of the many prices to pay. Through the, 
Let me say something about what the WHO is doing. WHO, as the UN agency responsible for health, we have, with the support of member states, 194 countries, adopted an international health regulations. This is an international treaty. It is the World Health Organization is mandated to keep the world alert to emerging and epidemic prone diseases and be ready to respond. The regulations were significantly revised and strengthened following the SARS outbreak. Previous efforts rely on stopping international spread at national borders. I don't think it is good to stop movement of people or goods and services I mean, for many reasons, not just for economic reasons. Hence, the regulations learn the lessons from SARS and change it, make the appropriate adjustment. We aim to stop outbreaks at their source before they have a chance to spread internationally. The world is better prepared for new diseases than it was in the previous century. For example, it took scientists more than three years to discover the virus that caused AIDS. It took scientists one month to discover the causative agent for SARS. The rise of social media has introduced a form of electronic transparency that makes it almost impossible to hide an outbreak. Rumors will always surface and spread in real time. WHO uses a dedicated search engine that constantly scans newsrooms, chat rooms, and blogs in multiple languages for rumors and hints of an unusual disease event. When countries need support in outbreak investigation and control, the World Health Organization uses our global outbreak alert and response network, consisting of scientists from many countries as a strike force, as a search capacity that can get experts with the right mix of skills to the outbreak site within 24 hours. WHO also has a network of specialized laboratories equipped to handle the world's most dangerous pathogens, for example, Ebola. These and other mechanisms strengthen our collective defense against the infectious disease threat. But true global security against this type of threat will occur only when more countries have their own capacity to prevent, to detect, and respond. And this will happen only when doing so becomes a higher political priority. And you, as the investment community, uh, is, is very influential to make sure that the countries or the cities that you are investing in, the government is paying attention there because you need that to protect your investment as well. A second threat, a second threat to our collective health security, needing urgent political intervention comes from the rise of antibiotic resistance. As WHO and others have been warning for more than a decade, this trend carries especially grave dangers for medical care everywhere. We are losing our first-line antibiotics, our miracle drugs. Replacement treatments are more costly, more toxic, and need much longer durations of treatment, and may require treatment in intensive care units. For some diseases, the death rate doubles when the drug resistance develops. Many common bacteria have developed resistance to multiple drugs, some to nearly all. Hospitals have become hotbeds for highly resistant superbugs, increasing the risk that hospitals kill rather than heal. These are end-of-the-road pathogens that are resistant to last-line drugs. If current trend continue, the future is easy to predict. Some experts say we are moving back to the pre-antibiotic era. No, no, no. This will be a post-antibiotic era. In terms of new replacement antibiotics, the pipeline is virtually dry. The cupboard is nearly bare. A post-antibiotic era means, in effect, an end to modern medicine as we know it. 
common infection will once kill. Some sophisticated interventions like hip replacements, organ transplants, cancer chemotherapy, and cure of preterm babies will become far more difficult or even too dangerous to undertake. Even simple operations, for example, laser surgery to treat myopia. Again, myopia is very prominent, uh, very prevalent in this part of the world, will become too dangerous to perform. So ladies and gentlemen, what does all this mean for the Asian investment community? What lies ahead? Without doubt, new diseases will continue to emerge, but not all will be socially or economically disruptive on a global scale. Some new pathogens never develop an ability to spread efficiently from one human to another. Fortunately, this is still the case with the H5N1 virus, the H7N9 viruses in Asia, and the mers cov virus in Middle East. So far, we do not see the risk of having a global epidemic, but we will never let our guard down. As I explained to you, the microbes has this resilience and the amazing ability to mutate and to change. Let me give you a sense of you know, where we stand with these different types of diseases by illustrating it with the incubation period. That is the period from infection to onset of disease. Now, the incubation period is also important for us to, to reflect. A short incubation period of one or two days reduces spread by international travel because the person gets sick too quickly. AIDS, with an incubation period of up to 10 years, 10 years, could easily and silently spread to every corner of the world. And this is exactly what is happening. For a disease like Ebola, patients are physically and visibly too ill to travel during their most infectious period. What about SARS? SARS has an incubation period of up to 14 days. It was ideally well suited to spread along the routes of international air travel. The cause of an outbreak, ladies and gentlemen, are usually out of proportion to the severity of the threat. As the World Bank report has cautioned, the greatest economic loss come not from the cost of medical treatment or control measures, but from the uncoordinated and irrational efforts of the public to avoid infection by cutting activities, by cutting down travels for business or for pleasure. I cannot overemphasize the importance of accurate and timely information during an outbreak. Use Please use your influence. You can be a change agent both ways, both in your companies and in the governments that you are investing in. Make sure timely and accurate information are shared. Number two, it is important also for you to understand what you can do to change the global food supply system. Some people described it as broken. Why? With the current emphasis on producing more food and ever cheaper price, the food supply is dangerously removed from its historical purpose of sustaining life and in good health. Very few questions, ladies and gentlemen. People would raise very few questions on the world's capacity to feed its 7 billion people, rising to 9 billion. But many do question the wisdom of cheaper prices that encourage overconsumption of unhealthy foods produced in environmentally unsustainable ways. In terms of managing the environmental issues and reducing the risk, sound investment decisions or consumer pressure can shift food production towards a healthier and more sustainable model. In Denmark, let me give you an example. Consumer preferences and pressure led to one of the earliest bans on the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. An international review panel set up by the World Health Organization at the request of the Danish government concluded that 
the ban reduced human health risks, while antibiotic resistance on farms declined, and livestock and poultry production actually increased. And I was told firsthand by the ministers of that country, their meat fetched the premium price. So these are important considerations for investment. Finally, finally, please do everything you can to reduce the misuse of antibiotics and encourage R&D for replacement medicines. The pharmaceutical industry, which is a great partner for the WHO, has few incentives to develop medicines for usually short episodes of infectious diseases. They rather invest in R&D for chronic diseases like heart disease, hypertension, because you need to take those medicines for life. For infectious diseases, you only take the medicine for a short course. So the, the, the market dynamic is very different you know, for the pharmaceutical industries to consider uh, where and how to invest. And of course, oftentimes, the misuse of a new antibiotic is also important because the misuse gives it a very short market life. You see what I'm saying? So you may not be able to max the intellectual property uh, right that you are, you know, uh, awarded. So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that at a time of multiple calamities in the world, we cannot and we cannot and we should not allow the loss of essential antibiotics, essential cure for many millions of people to become the next global crisis. On that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, to share with us your insights on how various you know, virus today are affecting and threatening our daily lives. As most, the majority of the audience, including myself, are the frequent business travelers. We have great interest in also to learn about what's happening today. And also, on behalf of the audience, you know, before we open to the NA, we really like to salute to your leadership in leading WHO and leading all the governments to fight against all the disease, infectious disease today. Thank you again, Dr. Chen. Thank you. I'm pretty sure that you know, we are all affected you know, by the viruses or all the in infectious diseases. And I'm pretty sure there will be some you know, uh, very interesting questions to ask Dr. Chen. You know, she has you know, you know, very limited time for us today. And she has a very busy you know, worldwide travel schedule, and uh, she was able to make herself available for the afternoon for us. No, uh, I thank you for giving me a homecoming. Thank you. I only see my family once a year, so this year I see them two times because thank of you. you. Thank you. OK, this lady in the back. Uh, Wendy Wong from RTHK. You mentioned in your speech that close contact between, uh, between humans and animals is one of the major causes for new diseases. So do you think Hong Kong government should stop the sale of live poultry? Well, I, I think this is one, uh, certainly one uh, area where the Hong Kong government uh, uh, need to consider. Um, many parts of the world, if you travel, you don't see wet markets. And, uh, but in this part of the world, uh, not just in Hong Kong, but also in uh, uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, they still and continue to have wet markets where they sell live poultry. But you can't really blame the government and put everything, uh, uh, put all the responsibility on the government. The, the, the cultural preference for fresh chicken, can we change that? If you can change that, I'm sure the government would be more than happy to, you know, over time, uh, phase out wet market. And I think the Hong Kong government, as long as I, uh, I can remember, they are trying to encourage that. OK, this gentleman. Um, hi, I represent a provident fund uh, whereby twin, only 20% of our employees are actually executive level. Uh, the other 80% are at the lower income level. Now, uh, how does government address the, f the, the, the issues of providing quality food, which is invariably much more expensive, to people who can't afford it? 
um, are, are there measures from a global level to, to address something like this? And can we really get out of uh, providing this cheap meat, as, as you had mentioned earlier on? Thank you. An excellent question. When we talk about food, we need to look at it uh, from two perspectives, quantity and quality. Now, in many parts of the world, well, let me use my own example uh, because I don't want to upset people. <laughs> you just consider how much you eat on a daily basis. Do uh, what I call a daily calendar of all the food you, you take. Actually, to stay healthy, you don't need to eat so much, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And if you eat more than your body needs, you become obese, mm -hmm. overweight, mm -hmm. and give you higher risk of developing hypertension, diabetes, and other types of diet-related cancer. So on an, individual, uh, on an individual basis, you can do something. Now, what about the agribusiness and the food production? Do they need to make food so sweet, to make drinks so sweet? What can they do? But I know that the industry is taking action to reformulate their products because they understand consumer pressure. So again, on the production, as I said, the world at this point in time can produce enough food for 7 billion people. And if I tell you, 30 to 50% of the food produced today never get to the market, never get to the consumer mm. because of infrastructural problem. Many of these produce are perishable, especially fruits and vegetable. If you do not have the transport infrastructure to help farmers to move their products to market, they get wasted. And storage is another problem. Grains, the rice, the corn and everything, if they are not properly uh, stored, they can go, uh, um, how should I say, they uh, perish and be wasted. So that means the A to Z, from farm to table, if all the actors, including the investors, pay attention to uh, efficient and effective and sustainable development model, I think we are in a much better place than what we are today. Thank you. No more question? Two more. Okay, this gentleman. Uh, Dr. Chen, what is the right attitude towards antibiotics? You painted a rather gloomy picture of post antibiotics. But whenever we go and see a doctor for a simple uh, illness like flu, we'll be very unhappy if the doctors does not uh, give us antibiotics or injection. I, I think, Jack, you asked an excellent question. The an antimicrobial resistance or antibiotic resistance is truly a very, very complex issue, and it touches many sectors. Let me begin by the individual. You, you, you said it. Far too many people expect doctors to prescribe antibiotics for them when they don't need them, number one. They pressurize the doctors, but of course, doctors also need to play their part as well. It's easy just to prescribe rather than to explain to you, you know, in a much more caring way, why you don't need that, how, what are the issues that you need to pay attention to. No. I've been a doctor uh, in, in, in the real sense, meaning see patients. It's easier to do a prescription than to explain. So that has to change as well. Now, of course, in a situation where you truly need a course of antibiotics, before I answer that question, okay, let me, let me finish the question. So normally, you, you need to take a full course of antibiotics about seven days, minimum five days. Mm -hmm. I have a doctor friend here, so I can see. Now, how many of you stop after two to three days? Far too many. I was meeting with ministers of health, uh, not, not uh, ministers of foreign affairs. On one uh, conversation, I told uh, the minister of foreign affairs about this. He said, "Dr. Chen, I'm one of the bad guys. 
I always stop after two days. Because when you begin to feel better after two days, you say that, I stop. So that, again, on an individual level, don't ask for antibiotics if you don't need it. And when you do need a course, finish the entire course. As I said, if you do not finish the course, you are encouraging strong bugs to become resistant. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, you know, if I tell you a big, big amount of antibiotics are used as growth promoters mm -hmm. in agribusiness, including livestock, including all the very economical and affordable shrimps that you are eating, or the seafood, because they are used to prevent disease and promote growth. Now, is it right or wrong? There is a, a need for use of antibiotics in animal husbandry, but it is all about misuse and abuse. So I'm sure uh, the World Health Organization, together with other UN uh, entities, like the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization, as well as the Animal um, Health Organization, we are working with our countries and to, to find solutions to make sure that you know, we have antibiotics to protect human health. If I tell you, we are down to the last antibiotics for malaria, what does it mean for the 2.5 billion population of the world that are you know, exposed to a mosquito sting and give you malaria? If, we are, if I tell you we are down to the last effective antibiotics for gonorrhea, Gonorrhea is on the rise. Watch out. So what are you going to do? So these are things that we are seeing in the medical practice. So we need to take you know, antibiotics as precious commodity and to protect and stretch their useful lives for as long as possible. So of course, as I said, government must have in place the right policy environment for people to, to do all these uh, multi-sectoral uh, work. And of course, as I said, the pharmaceutical industry is not inclined to invest in um, uh, areas where they have uh, you know, unsure return on investment. So we all need to play our part. And I know that something very good is happening uh, between European Union uh, with some very prominent pharmaceutical company to go into uh, joint investment for um, in, um, developing new antibiotics. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Dr. Chen, um, good afternoon. As you know, like uh, all of us are exposed to many bacteria on a daily basis, but how do you know that what kind of diseases are we exposed? For instance, I just recovered from dengue, oh and dear. I didn't find out until my six days. And same goes to some of my family members as well. Mm. So Wh how where, where are you from? Malaysia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, dengue, as I said, has increased 30-fold. Mm. Why? It has much to do with uh, human activities. Now, number one, the mosquito, which causes dengue, is not present in every country. Let me make that point very clear. But it is indeed pre present in many countries, including Malaysia, Singapore, this part of the world in particular, and also in Africa and in the, the Americas. Now, dengue up to now, we don't have a medicine to treat dengue. And the vaccine for dengue, well, hopefully it will be up and coming soon, okay? So basically, when you get dengue, stung after you're stung by the uh, mosquito, Aedes aegypti, for example, you will get the disease. And what we can give you as doctors or hospitals and clinics is what we call supportive treatment. And many people recover, but unfortunately, I mean, it's sad to say, some do succumb to dengue. So the important piece is, number one, 
to continue R&D to come up with a good vaccine and good medicines. And because there are four types of uh, uh, dengue, and that makes it much more complex, okay? Now, the second piece is, do you grow plants in, in, at home? Because, you know, human activities contribute to the mosquito breeding. Oftentimes, the, the, uh, at least you don't have it here, the, <laughs> the pot plants that you keep at home, when you water them, some water are collected uh, at, the, at the bottom, it would, at the plate. That small quantity of water is sufficient for the mosquito to breed. Mm -hmm. So when I was trained in public health in Singapore, you know what they teach us? put half a teaspoon of sugar or half a teaspoon of salt in that water so that the mosquito cannot breathe. So what can you as an individual or at the family level do to make sure that you do not have small collections of water uh, in the environment to encourage mosquito breathing? Now, another important dimension. In many parts of, um, in many countries where you have villages, where you don't have pipe water, people begin to collect water in reservoirs, uh, what do you call reservoirs, what do you call it? <laughs> containers, oh, sorry, <laughs> in containers. If they're not properly covered, mosquito can breed there. So we need to make sure that health authorities advise individuals and families on what are the measures you can take to avoid mosquito breeding that will give you dengue. Now, another important thing. After you drink your soda, after you change your car tire, don't throw them anywhere. Environmental pollution caused by all these enables small collections of water for mosquito to breed. So the most important thing is we call this vector-borne disease. Of course, government has to also do um, vector control, but individuals, community can do a lot more. Dengue can be, were you pretty sick? Oh, sorry, I don't want to ask a personal medical <laughs> question. But it's unpleasant, let, let me say it this way, right? So. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, yeah, please, this gentleman, no more question, yeah, after this one, because we're running out of time. A, a yeah. quick question for you. Are you seeing more incidents of motor neuron disease being associated with humans and animals? Say it again. Are you seeing more incidents of motor neuron disease being contracted f from the contact of humans and animals? Uh, not yet. But I don't know whether I have not read the most up-to-date report or there is no such relationship. So I don't have the answer for your question. Sorry. Good. Okay. First time I've caught without an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chen, again thank on you. behalf of the audience. Thank you.